Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. And I'm so excited to be here today. Welcome to the Firetime Podcast. Now, I'm looking around at all of the episodes that we've done this season, and I'm really excited. This is actually the longest season that we've had in the podcast so far, and I'm laughing because season five is going to start the Tuesday after Labor Day, and we're actually not going to have that much of a break between season four and five because we've been pumping out so much content. I love it. I hope that you guys do too. In today's episode, we are going to be diving deep on department number four of eight, in a winning hearth retailer. And this is something just to bring you up to speed for those of you that this might be the first episode in the series you've listened to. About a year ago, Grant Falco and I were on an airplane to Minneapolis and we had a brainstorming session of our eight departments that we used to run our businesses and all the tools that helped us do that. And the back half of this podcast season has been dedicated to that. So this is department number four of eight and it is the service department. Now, if you want to back up, you can listen to leadership, sales, and installation in the previous three episodes, but today we're diving deep on service. Before we do that, though, one thing I just want to make known to everybody who hasn't signed up yet is you need to check out the Firetime Network. Now, the Firetime Network launched back in March, and it's got just about 400 people in it right now from the hearth industry. And basically, these are business leaders that have come to one spot to get better. And ultimately, within the Firetime Network, what you're going to find is courses. There's there's a ton of free courses that, that go through how to run meetings, how to do sales, installation, just very tangible things right now as we're kind of figuring out this new normal in the midst of the COVID crisis, these courses will absolutely make a difference and shape your business. So you get access to courses, you get access to leaders, distributors, manufacturers, and all kinds of people in the industry. And lastly, you're going to get inspiration. Basically, our rhythm is that every week we're posting a video with one thing you need to be thinking about throughout the upcoming week. We're going to be posting a poll where you can get information on other companies and you can report yourself how things are going. We do that on a once a week basis. And then every month we've got a happy hour phone call. So to check that out, you can go to the firetimenetwork.com. It's totally free to sign up. The only thing is that you're going to have to fill out an anonymous survey about the state of our industry expo. So if you go to the firetimenetwork.com and click sign up, you can take the survey and then it will prompt you to create an account. Okay, so jumping into today's episode on service, a couple things I want to talk about first is that number one, there's going to be a lot of crossover in regards to similarities to the installation department because service and installation are very, very similar. Now, they're not the same. And I know there's a lot of companies where the installers double as service techs, and that's okay when you're a small company growing, but as your company starts to scale, you really do want to separate these out. And for me, that's actually something that I really didn't understand for my first probably nine years in the industry. I just assumed that service and installation were all the same. Uh, In this upcoming conversation, I I mentioned that prior to working at Fireside Home Solutions, I I one time had an owner of a company that I worked for tell me, you know, service is a necessary evil. You grit your teeth, you offer it because you want to take care of your customers, but it will never make you money. It will always just make your life terrible. And, and I would actually disagree with that. Me and Grant jump into that pretty heavily in this episode, but if you feel like that, it's understandable. And so my hope for you is that this episode can give you tools and just some basic steps to take to grow your service team, even if that's just one person, because the truth is that, that if you've already built an installation department, it's not that hard to cross over to service. Service can be implemented very quickly, which is amazing. The other thing with service too is that service is a monster moneymaker. I mean, honestly, service work is probably your highest margin work in the company. I mean, it truly is. And I would actually think about service as a marketing that pays you. Because people have problems and they need those problems solved. If you can deliver an amazing experience from start to finish, fix those problems and leave with happy customers, they will tell their friends because no one really knows where to go to to fix their fireplace. 
I mean, so this is something that you got to take advantage of. Think about it as marketing that pays you. Now, in this conversation, I'm just going to bring up a few things to listen for, and then I'll get out of the way, and, and you can hear the conversation with Grant. We talk very specifically about accountability and metrics. This is super important, and we haven't done it yet. I think in season five, we probably will, but at some point in the future, we're going to do an episode on creating scoreboards for your teams. Creating a public scoreboard for the people in your company is one of the most important things you can do as a leader. And there's going to be different scoreboards depending on what the role of the team members is. But we spend a lot of time talking about Grant's service scoreboard. Having the accountability of a scoreboard where on a weekly basis, team members can look at it. They can know if they won. They can know if they lost. They have to give a report for their progress or lack thereof on the scoreboard is very powerful. And I'm telling you, it's not micromanagement. This is actually the way that you rally team members together. Your team members actually want that accountability. And chances are that they might already be winning, but they don't know it. So your scoreboard is going to help them know that they're winning. And if your company is losing, it aligns everybody as to what's wrong and what we need to do together. So we dive deep on this. The very last thing I'll say is that when it comes to accountability, this is one of the hardest parts of being a leader. I have conversations with business owners all the time, and and it is very, very hard to have conversations of accountability. As you start to be intentional with setting expectations, with having a public scoreboard, and having a cadence of regular meetings, you're going to find that a lot of the pieces of accountability take care of themselves because you've built a framework. Now, you still have to drive the ship and you still have to have tough conversations, but the data is the data. And when you gather on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis to review it, you're not speaking emotionally, you're not coming unhinged and they're just saying, hey, why is that person being such a jerk? You're speaking about, hey, this is the mark that we were trying to go to and we didn't hit it. Let's talk about why that is together. So, My hope is that you listen intently for those things in the conversation. And as always, we'll circle back at the end and talk about it. But in the meantime, I want you to listen to this conversation with Grant Falco. Joining me once again is Grant Falco. And Grant, this series has been awesome so far. I've been really stoked on kind of going through department by department. And it's funny that like... We had this idea coming up on a year ago on a flight to Minneapolis together. We started breaking down like what are the eight departments of a hearth company and it's been really fun to take a deep dive and today's conversation is going to come right on the heels of last week where you laid out in detail last week how to set up an installation department to exceed expectations of your customer, make you money and be something that you can have run itself where, yeah, you're involved to fine tune, but you're not reinventing the wheel every week when you're trying to figure out what's our process for going out to a job. And I think that service has a lot of similarities to install. So there's going to be some things here that sound pretty similar, right? Oh, there's no question. I mean, both departments are in the field and in the field departments require a lot of expectations, whether it's with the employees or with the consumers. And so, yeah, we're going to follow a lot of the stuff in line. I think also the nice thing about service is there's a lot of trackability. It's a high labor revenue parts, four or five, six different customers a day. So there's different ways of managing uh, that department than installation, but more or less, it all comes down to, like we talked about last week, managing expectations. Yeah. And this is one of those things in my first probably 10 years in the industry, I was always told this was implicitly and explicitly that service was a necessary evil. So I, I literally had someone tell me that, you know, ran a successful business, service will never make you money, it will always be a dead weight in your company, and you just have to grit your teeth and get through it. And as I started to move into other positions, I realized that could not be further from the truth, right? I mean, why is that mentality so wrong when it comes to service? You know, I understand that mentality, Tim, where I run a fourth generation family owned business and service was that thing we did to kind of keep things going and keep our customers kind of happy. It was negative. It was never good. We rotated through service tax. It was hard to keep service tax. And so I, I understand that mentality. I think the, the blessing that I had was that uh, I dared to get into HVAC six or seven years ago. And you learn a lot by diversifying on how different industries do it. And I started to realize that HVAC, like 
I try to get on the sales side of HVAC. I try to come in, be a salesperson, installer, and service person. 90% of the HVAC industry starts through service yeah. and they make money at service. The HVAC industry has turned service into a customer satisfaction department and also a revenue maker. And uh, I believe flat rate has a lot to do with that. And I think that, that, that your approach to service and how you set up your service trucks, your people and that kind of stuff have so much to do with whether it's successful. If we, if we kind of just let our service department go, it's, it's just going to go wherever in a million different directions. I found that of all the departments, the service department is the one that has to be not micromanaged, but managed as structurally based as possible. And, uh, you know, that's why we kind of started with, we had meetings going on for a long period of time, but we started getting into some key performance indicators and that kind of stuff. And we beta tested that through service because it was the easiest one to track and uh, ended up, you know, kind of turning our service department around. And I would say that it's still a struggle, but man, I see, I see, uh, I see good, good numbers coming in through our service department in the last couple of years and, and even through this COVID crisis. Yeah. And service is one of those things too. Like if you can get this right, service is the, it's the highest margins in your company is the lowest overhead, highest margins. And, and honestly, like this is where you really win the customer experience. These are the customers that will leave you. Like if you want to get to 500 Google reviews quickly, service is the track that will get you there. If you want your company to create an amazing customer experience where people rave about you and tell all their friends, service is the easiest path to get there. So it's worth building this out. And, and you're in a position now where you have a successful service team and I want to get into why that is, you know, you, you mentioned moving to flat rate pricing versus hourly. I mean, we've had this discussion before, like hourly pricing on service. Don't do it. Don't do it. Like move to flat rate prices. It's better for you. It's better for the customer. We'll, we'll get to that later. But you had an epiphany a while ago, and I'd, I'd like you to tell the story about what it was that was kind of the, the last straw in really thinking about your service department intentionally. Yeah. So Falco's has, we've done standard weekly meetings for three or four years now. I'm very proud. And those meetings were fantastic for us. But as you progress in business and you start meetings, you start to realize how much a structure to a meeting is important. And how I stumbled across understanding that was out of frustration, out of like beating my head against the wall and just going, what the heck? I keep talking about these things. We keep saying these things. Yet I can't keep it from staying consistent. I can't, it's, it, I'll change things for 30 days and then it would go back. And I came away from a meeting, just super, a service meeting, just super frustrated. I basically walked out of the meeting. Uh, I didn't know what I could do differently. And I felt like the best impact I could make was showing them how upset I was and walking out of the meeting. Yeah. I mean, talk about lack of leadership, but we, that's a de- de- different story. I called you. Uh, and we had a conversation and you pointedly asked me, and I don't even think your intention was to startle me, but you, you asked, well, what are your expectations of the service department and, or Ted, the service manager? (laughs) And I did not have an answer and it killed me. It like, it rocked my world, Tim. And, uh, I just, it was, it, it consumed me. And so, uh, I, I knew that I had things somewhat figured out and I knew the direction was good, but I didn't know what that next step was. And I think finding out what my expectations were, were absolutely key. And I tend to worry, process, agonize on topics like this because I need to get to a solution. And I -hmm. I think that's a fault of mine and also a positive feature because it gets me to the solution quick. It's agonizing, but for two days I agonized and it just hit me. Uh, I, it, (laughs) Some of my clearest thought process is in the morning. And uh, even when I'm showering, I think my mind just races on all sorts of things. And it just came to me. And I knew what I needed was uh, to manage expectations. But what did I expect? And what did I need from my employees, my department, and my business? And it came down to three things. Accountability, consistency, and efficiency. If you were to ask me, what do I expect? I could say a million different things. Yeah. Those are the results, more revenue, happier people. Like those are results. You have to put a, you have to think of what is going to get you there. And I believe accountability above all else 
is what's going to make your employees happy and you happy. It's the hardest thing to get over, but creating a system of accountability is absolutely key, and especially in a service department. And I'm going to stop you right there, Grant, because this actually makes a nice little acronym, right? Accountability, consistency, and efficiency. I think that this ACE system is something that you're going to, I, I just think that for you, we need to talk about this in depth in a future podcast because, because there is something here to the way that leadership works. You know, I, I, I agree with that, Tim. We've talked about it and there it's an execution system and it's been amazing because we beta tested it through the service department, but we're now bleeding it and have bled it through all the departments, different variations of it, but it all comes down to accountability, consistency, and efficiency. And everybody understands that we can talk about and we will get into this, how we do that, but it's, it's by holding them accountable consistently. And you, you know what you get? You get efficient employees, an efficient department. Uh, and so, yeah, we put together what was called the ACE execution system. Now, this isn't about the ACE execution system. This is about the service department, yeah. but they really go hand in hand in regards to success. So when we have a meeting, yes, a weekly service meeting, we meet every week. And we go over key performance indicators. Now, it's important that I say you have to have goals in order to have key performance indicators. And goals are not easy to make. And for our service department, it was kind of a struggle to put goals together. You have to put them, you know, put them together in a, a way that uh, is specific, measurable, attainable, yeah. uh, relatable, and time-based. And it was difficult, but once we got our goals established, whether it was revenue based, whether it was uh, how how little warranties we can we can get, or what was our av- how high can we get our average service rate? We started to get into the weeds, kind of technical because service allows you to do that. And after we had goals, we created KPIs, and basically, Tim, we manage them on a weekly basis. And okay, so I'm going to stop you. This, I want to go deep on this. This is really good. Okay, so what you did, you realized. I got to set an expectation, right? If I don't have yeah. an expectation for my team members, how on earth do they even know what to do, right? And I can't get mad yeah. at their performance because I haven't laid an expectation. That realization is a game changer. And so many businesses, when it comes to their service department, can take note of that. So yeah, the is. next step was goals. So can you talk about, like, you don't have to get into specific numbers, but can you give some examples of, like, what were some of the goals that you looked at with your service team? So that way you're putting a marker on the horizon of, this is where we're trying to get to. Yeah. So I think for service department, it's kind of low hanging fruit when you're establishing goals for a department uh, and goals are difficult. And I'm not saying these goals are necessarily perfect or amazing goals, but we had to set some type of expectation, you know, and some direction. And so yep. we, we wanted to hit $400,000 in service revenue. We knew based on wow. last, <laughs> last year's numbers, it was a, a 20% increase, but that was our goal. Now, COVID has affected that, obviously, but I'm still getting seven, eight, nine thousand dollar weeks out of our service department. And I would say that's because of the meetings and we can get into that separately. But yeah, four hundred thousand dollars in revenue for service department was one of our goals. And then we could break that down into KPIs through kind of what was a good week, what was an okay week, an average week that's gonna get us the goal, and maybe what is a week that we didn't hit the mark. So we know if we're winning or learning to get to that goal. The other goals that we set up in relation to that were a physical service number. Uh, We wanted to do 3,120 services. And that was, again, an increase. And we knew that if we could control how many services we were doing in a week, we would always be maximizing. Don't worry about next week. Hit the best number and win this week with your service. Man, services are always going to come, and we can always try to do warmer cold calls to get more service in the off season. So, for people who are listening, so what you just did, so you set a top line revenue goal. This yeah. is this is the top line revenue of where we want to go, and then you set a goal of how many total service calls. So those those goals are amazing in and of themselves. Just to say, you know, here's the here's the two places that we're trying to go: this much revenue, this many service calls. And then you break that into KPIs for your team. So so KPI stands for a key performance indicator. And this is yeah. going to be the stuff like the lead measures of, of, of kind of how do we get there? Like we can look at these KPIs on a weekly basis. What, what are some examples of KPIs? Yeah. So the, the KPIs are very goal related and efficiency related. And so, you know, when we talked about this, Tim, when I was putting this together, I put 10 KPIs together and I, I remember you going, whoa, whoa, that's, that's a lot of KPIs. And I felt that I, 
but I, I felt that they were necessary. So I'll yeah. take you through the 10 KPIs just I, real I love quick it. and then explain what the KPIs get us and how it yeah. kind of affects our team. So the number one is parts revenue. This is all parts that go out the door. What are okay. we doing on a weekly basis in parts revenue? The second one is service revenue invoice. So what are we as a group revenueing each week in service? Tech revenue per service. So we divide the tech's individual revenue for the week by the services they did so that we have an average of what they're doing per service. And then we I create goals within that to create more incentive. Tech revenue per hour. I break down their hours versus their revenue. So I can actually look at my service tech and for 2019 know that Tyler Page was bringing me $130 per hour he worked for me. What an amazing tool to utilize yeah. and also a confidence booster for him. And it, that's a double, like that KPI works amazing. I'm just going to tell you the service manager is responsibility is responsible and incentivized on that number. And do you know why? Because we have a lot of times the service technicians are hanging around for an hour, maybe two hours after the jobs around the store talking to everybody. They aren't anymore because the service manager is tied to that yeah. uh, hourly rate. And if they're hanging out not servicing, that rate's going down. Uh, we wanted it to make a goal of less than 10% of warranties, which is a weird one kind of. like. But I want to explain that real quick. We, yeah. we, we look at warranties as no charge. Like mm -hmm. warranties are, are anything that doesn't have someone paying for it. So yep. our warranties, like if we go out on a manufacturer warranty, that's okay. I'm totally fine with that. But we have Falco warranties where we make mistakes and we have to figure that out and track that. And so by tracking this, we break down warranties every week and we understand them. Is Falco's paying for it? Is the customer paying for it? Is the manufacturer well, paying for it? That visibility is amazing because you, basically what you're saying is we understand this stuff happens, but our goal is that more than 90% of the time that someone is going out, we're getting paid for it. That's a totally. very reasonable goal. 100%. And then I don't have to get overwhelmed when I get at the end of the month, this warranty report that has like 17 warranties on it. Well, 17 warranties over that week might be less than 10%. And I'm okay with that now. It makes sense uh, mathematically. So yeah. we track proposed repairs. I expect that they propose repairs 50% of the time. Now that's, I get questioned on that a little bit. Can they not propose uh, preventative maintenance for the future if everything is good to go? Uh, yeah. Is there not something that maybe is close to replacement level almost every time on something that's eight years or older? Yeah. We have outfitted them with tools, primarily a megometer that allows them to test the insulation of all motors and, and fans and that type of stuff. And it gives them an amazing tool uh, to propose repairs when things are close to replacement level. If you're going out there and just like doing stuff and you don't know where that is, how can you propose a repair? You can't. So we well, have you at least make them aware of it, right? So like yeah. how much better is it that you at least say, hey, it looks like your fan is coming towards the tail end of its life. Do you want to replace it? The customer says, no, thank you. But then it breaks two months later. That's so much better oh. than oh. you were out of my house two months ago and then it breaks after you're there. 100%. My callbacks on me paying for the callbacks went down drastically as, far as, as, far, as soon as we started proposing more often. There, there, was there was times, I mean, honestly, if a customer, doesn't matter what you propose as a fix, if they were proposed a fix and declined a fix, even if it's an unrelated problem the next time, they will not use that. They will not say, hey, this is something you should have caught the first time because they declined yeah. for you to work on that appliance. So it's a huge leg up if you propose repairs. People sign that they have to decline or accept on our proposal. It's amazing that you track that. And it's amazing because we started out getting like 20, 25%. I will say that we're in between 50 and 55% on average on a weekly basis of proposal rate. Sometimes Terrific. it's just not feasible, but 50% of the time, it truly yep. is. Yep. Uh, services completed. So we want to know services completed. Obviously, we have a goal of 3,120 services to do. And, uh, and so we have like anywhere from 60 to 74 is yellow. Uh, in red is less than 60 and above 75 is green. And that's just trying to get us to that 3,120. Yeah. If we hit yellow every single time, we'll get there. Yeah. But we're not going to hit that every time. So we have yeah. to offset our 
loss or red weeks with our green weeks. And that's how we track yep. that and win. Uh, we track truck inventory completed every Monday. They are expected to take inventory, restock off our shelves and we track it. And we only track it if it's being done right now. There's one step to the process. It's if it's going to be done. The second step is then managing the inventory. Now, don't get me wrong. I still go through a report of managing their inventory. What was off? Why was it off? That type of stuff. But as of right now, the KPI is just, are they taking it or not? Yep. Um, the last few, urgent incomplete. Uh, if we go out to a job and it is expected that we complete it and it is not completed, that is an urgent incomplete, it goes into another kind of bowl and gets managed uh, to completion within one week. And then uh, we grade all the paperwork. So when every company has problems with uh, how the paperwork is filled out from service tax yeah. and what is the next step. And so our clerical staff has set up a grading scale with me. And so we grade all the paperwork coming back. It's a very simple grading scale and we expect it to be 98% or better. And it's directly tied to efficiency, right? So like yeah. if they don't have to go back to my service tax or service managers over and over again, I'm, I'm more efficient. So the service techs and managers know that we're grading the paperwork we uh, expect high, high numbers because there's no reason it shouldn't be right every right. time. They get back at the end of the day, they double check it and they submit it, right? And so now we're at, we're, I mean, I'm looking at a report that's 96.84% and we were always above 90, 95%. I asked the support staff, hey, when the scores are good on the paperwork, is it a direct correlation to helping you guys? And it's an overwhelming yes. Yeah. So that was a, a run through of the, the 10 KPIs. We'll get back to our conversation with Grant Falco in just one minute. Hey, one thing I want to ask you as you are listening to this podcast today is to think about how you track your sales, or do you? How is it that you know your team members are working on the right thing? Or if you're a small company and you wear multiple hats, one of them being sales, how do you set out a game plan for the week to where you know what you're going after and how you're doing on that progress? I think the sad reality of our industry is that there's a lot of people in the sales department that are busy but not productive. I know this because it was me for years and years. I even had some relatively decent success without actually planning my opportunities and going after them. But once I was able to do that, things changed. One of the things that is absolutely necessary to win in the sales game is to create a weekly game plan. Now, what would happen if you or your team members on a weekly basis planned out opportunities? Say that you had 40 customers this upcoming week at different stages of the sales pipeline that you knew you were following up with. They were always in front of you and you could track the results of every conversation. Not only that, but what if part of your weekly plan was calling five customers from the past to thank them, ask how they're doing, and possibly win referrals or online reviews? To top it all off, say that you had a weekly big three of three important tasks that have to be done. Well, what we've done with Wi-Fi is we've taken this weekly game plan and moved it into an automated platform. Launching in August, we have a customer database that will categorize every opportunity you have and allow both you and your team members to create weekly game plans. You and your team members can go through the different stages of your sales pipeline to select customers that you want to follow up with this week. The beauty of it is that when you create your weekly game plan, you can choose who gets CC'd on that email for accountability. So if you're a sales manager, you'll be copied on every weekly game plan of your team members so you know what they're going to be doing for the week and you can help remove roadblocks so they can get it done. You can even schedule weekly meetings around this where team members all come to the table with their weekly game plan and you report your success and brainstorm what you're going to do for the rest of the week. For me personally, this has been an absolute game changer and I'm so excited to launch it with Wi-Fi. So if you want your sales to grow by creating a system and a process that makes your team more effective than ever, you need to go to wifire.com and sign up. That's W-H-Y-F-I-R-E.com. This is going to launch in August, so take advantage now. Okay, I'm going to stop you, Grant. So, so this is amazing. And I know that this is a quick interview. And, and I think that at some point, we need to start exploring a deep dive in the FireTime Network on, on how to build these out. But for the people listening, you have to think about this. And, and someone might say, well, there's no way you can track these metrics. 
And I think that you would say, uh, yeah, you can, and I do. But but the point is, start out with three. Start out with exactly four. Right. And, and, and where I want to go as we finish this interview, so a couple things you talked about. Number one, truck inventory. Every tech needs to have a truck inventory that needs to be checked on a regular basis and, and turned in the, the accuracy of, of their inventory levels. But can you elaborate on green, yellow, red, and the yeah. public scoreboard? Yeah. Yeah. So I think all the things that we talked about are amazing, but they only work if they're done consistently and they're done in public, if that makes sense, like yeah. in front of their peers. And so, uh, I believe, we believe, Tim, that if, if you were to ask me one thing an employee wants from their job on a daily basis, I would tell you they want to win. Yes. That's what I would tell you. I would tell you they, they want to come to work and they want to win as much as they possibly can. And our job as leaders is to tell them when they win. Again, managing expectations. So, I knew my employees were winning, but I couldn't thank them every time they were winning. I couldn't go through and say, great job every time they stayed late or did this. I just, that's not realistic. I miss them. And I believe that you have to reward them, but I also believe they have to learn from their mistakes and accountability is the key. And then when you put it into a public scoreboard, it makes it, it makes it a a, a win-win for both parties. So with our KPIs, every single KPI that I just went through, has a red column, which is below average. It has a yellow column, which is average, and it's average based on goals, expectations that we put together as a team, not just me. And then there's green. And what it does to the service technicians and service manager, it aligns them and it puts them in the same direction as just wanting to win. And I put the information out there so I get the results that I want. And then we come to a meeting and man, my service techs are actually there early and just are salivating at looking at this. Now, sometimes they're disappointed and that's okay. The cool part about a meeting and having them consistently consistently is that outside of that meeting, you're emotional and you're dealing with a million other things. When you're in the meeting, you're focused on the service department. And when they win, you celebrate, you hand out gift cards, you, you make sure that yeah. they're rewarded for it. And when they lose, you hold them accountable and you make yeah. sure they learn from it. And we have a saying that we win or we learn. We win or we learn. And so the green and the yellow just is a visual indicator of what, do I, what did we win and what do we need to learn from? Why did this happen? And it's amazing. Our team... Uh, we'll actually meet before our meetings, go over all the reds and figure out why before they come to the meeting so they have explanation. And you know what? It's Sometimes it's just that there was vacation, right? Or or this. It doesn't have to be bad. It's we're learning from it. So I think and then having it up on the TV every time we meet is absolutely vital. If it's <laughs> not up on the TV, they don't know it. They don't know they're winning. You don't get that incentive anymore. So I love that, man. And as so as I'm boiling this down, I, I think you've done four things. So for somebody listening to this that feels like I need my service department to become a money maker, I need it to help my customers enjoy our products more and grow my business. I think it starts number one: set expectations and goals. Right? Understand 100%. where you want to go. That's the goal. And then set the expectation of you know what do you want your team members to do? Right? So start with expectations and goals. Next, regular meetings. You got to meet regularly. If you're not meeting regularly, you're sunk. If you, yeah. I, I've had companies where the service tech has kind of been a lone wolf. Just they just go do their thing in their truck every day and don't do it. Right, regular meetings. Yep. Next is KPIs and a scoreboard. So understand the indicators that will get you to your goal and post it publicly on a scoreboard. Lastly, just rinse and repeat. Right. Set yeah. expectations and goals. Number one. Number two. Meet regularly. Number three, have key performance indicators and a public scoreboard and do it again and again and again and again. That's exactly right. I mean, truthfully, in our industry, uh, uh, trying to compete with HVAC employees on the service side, install side, we have to take good to great. We have to take good employees to great employees. And the way you do that is by holding them accountable, keeping it consistent, and they'll ultimately be so extremely efficient. It makes you just, you know, the happiest owner in the world. Yeah. And I, I want to just do some math here. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw some numbers together for people that don't value service the way that they should. Okay. So, so let's think about an average fireplace and let's say that an average fireplace with installation runs 4,500 bucks. Okay. 
And let's say that you can make a 40% margin on that. Okay. So that means that you're walking away your company with $1,800 versus a service call. Service call, 275 bucks, but you're clearing, let's say a 70% margin. Okay. So $192. I mean, you could potentially service over a 20 year period. You could get 15 service calls out of a customer pretty easily, right? Over a 20 year period going out there, you know, every, every year and a half or so. Yeah. So, so you look at that and over the, over the course of that 20 years, you're actually at $2,800 profit out of that customer versus someone that buys a fireplace at $1,800. You figure people buy fireplaces every 20 years or so. I mean, the math on this, if you've got a structured service department, this is a moneymaker. And, and it's also a blessing to your customers. And, and the, as I'm going to round out here, I want to just finish the interview on pricing because in companies in the past, I, I, I've had them charge hourly and they say, we're doing our customers a favor. We're not going to overcharge for anything. I had, I had a company that broke down their service hours into 15 minute increments. And it was a disaster because we thought we were doing the customer a favor, but we weren't we would argue with our service tech and with the customer over which 15 minute increment do we bill for. We never charged enough. If there was a callback, we were totally sunk. And the customer was so uncertain, they'd call us on the phone and say, hey, my fan's out. How much is it going to cost? And we'd go, well, you know, it depends. I mean, if we're out there for an hour and 15 minutes, it'll be this much. But, but you know, it could be two hours and 15 minutes. So it could be this much. Customer sitting there going, that that uncertainty is yeah. worse than yes. overpaying for something. It's worse yes. no. to, to, to just say a service call for a fan is $275 plus the fan. The customer now knows, can I afford it or not? Yeah. I mean, it is so much better to charge a flat rate that protects your company if you need to go back out and gives the customer clarity. These are just things, there's so many things in business where we think we're doing the customer a favor, but we're actually confusing them and that makes their life worse. 100%. The one thing I'll add to that is flat rate is absolutely key to customer satisfaction. And it's hard to yes. convince yourself of that. But once you start to see it, it's so evident. The other thing is, is really, if you want to do service attack service, because there is service there, so many people are shying away from service in your town. And if you want to, uh, if you want to go after it, you can go after it. Reoccurring revenue is absolutely key yes. to us surviving yes. the off season and preventative maintenance is possible. We are selling three and five year preventative maintenance plans and keeping our service department going in the off season with two service technicians. And that way it allows us to get to a third every season, or at least the last few seasons to maximize the payoff. We'd like to get to more because the demand is there because we service almost every product. Now we have a product list of what we will and won't service so that we don't get into really hairy situations, but we risk it. And we go after the customer with the diagnostic and a flat rate and then we try to hit them with future business as far as preventative maintenance. Well, and if you do a good job, again, this is marketing that pays you. Like, how much of your marketing pays you? Really? Service, it pays you. And it pays you yep. a great margin. Yep. You go out to a customer's house, perform a service they need, make good money. They're super happy because no one else yep. could fix their fireplace. And that is top of mind awareness. Like, we're going to talk later about the difference between marketing and branding, how branding is a slow play where you don't have a hard and fast call to action. It's just keeping yourself top of mind. That's what this is, right? Like, yeah. you're going out there for a service. And if you give them an amazing experience and their neighbor needs a fireplace, who's top of mind. I mean, this is marketing yeah. that pays you. Yep. Awesome. Grant, I appreciate your time. I know that a ton of people are going to get value out of this. And I think it's just evident that we need, we need a fire time network course that goes into a deep dive on this. Yeah. There's so much to talk about. I found myself multiple times during this wanting to talk about other directions of this. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into that later. I'm, I'm happy with what we did. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks for being here today. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sam. Well, I hope you guys got as much value out of that conversation as I did. Man, that was awesome getting to talk with Grant about service. There's a few things that I really want to hit before I sign off. And the first one is just the importance of having a truck inventory. This is something that isn't done in a lot of companies, but it's not that hard to set up. I mean, this can start with just a simple piece of graph paper with what do I want to keep on the truck? What did I use? And what's on the truck now that's turned in every single week, but you have to start there. If your service trucks aren't going out prepared 
to a customer's house, you're done. You need to take care of absolutely everything possible on that first trip, and a truck inventory is just the way to do it. So if you have questions about that, you can write in to me and to Grant, and we can talk about this in our Q&A episode that's going to be coming up. My email address is tim at itsfiretime.com, but the truck inventory is where you have to start. After that, we mentioned this kind of in passing at the end, but I would think very, very hard about flat rate service. In pretty much every model I've seen of service that's charged out based on time, the company never wins because there's so many things that charging for time doesn't account for. It doesn't account for driving to and from a job. If there was a misunderstanding of what was wrong with the fireplace and the customer had one impression but you had another, it can be easy to just go back on your own rates. I found personally when I was in businesses that charged based on time spent, we always lost. It was not something that we won. And if you think about this, like with service, it's so much better to charge a flat rate that protects you and covers you and allows you the margin to create a good customer experience, employ good technicians and keep them happy with their pay than to charge out in increments based on time and you're barely eking by, your margins are low and nobody's happy. The first scenario is so much better. I was a guest on another podcast a few weeks ago, and an example that I gave is like, if I'm going to go on a family vacation and drive to go see Grant in Spokane, Washington, and he lives like six and a half hours away from me, I'm not going to look and say, well, Spokane is... 674 miles from my house. And so this means that if I get 13.6 gallons of gas, I can exactly make it to Spokane and fill up when I get there. That is literally the stupidest thing in the world. Instead, what I do is I fill up my entire tank and I drive to Spokane with extra. That's what preparing for the real world means and you need to think about your service calls that way. Okay, so that's all the time that I'll spend on flat rate service, but I'm just gonna tell you, switch to flat rate. Again, if you have questions, email me and Grant and I can tackle that in the last episode of the season. Okay, once we've gone past that, I wanna give you the basics of creating a scoreboard for your service team. And it's gonna start with three KPIs. Now, a KPI stands for a key performance indicator. On your scoreboard, number one, you need to track the total service calls this year versus last year. Really easy, right? I mean, you look up how many calls you did last year this month, and then you look at how many services are on the books this year during that month. This is going to tell you Are we winning or are we losing compared to last year? The next thing on your scoreboard that you need to track is the callbacks and return trips from previous jobs. And the metric that you want to be under is 10%, okay? So you want your rate of return trips, and this could be due to you not having a part, not being prepared, or callbacks, something failing. For any reason, you have to go back to that job. You want that under 10% for the amount of service calls that you had that month. This is something, again, that's very easy to track. The last metric, this is really important. Average technician total per service. So what you want to do is you want to take your technicians, add up their total revenue per week, and divide it by the number of service calls they had. These three metrics will teach you so much about your service department. And I'm telling you, this is a public scoreboard. You're not hiding any of this. Having a scoreboard like this and reviewing it on a weekly basis will keep you aligned. It will help you start to be able to pull levers to improve performance, and it will let you see where the weak links in the chain are. At some point, we'll talk about building scoreboards for more of your departments, but this right here is low-hanging fruit for service. If you can start tracking these three metrics on a weekly basis and reviewing it with your teams, it will change the way that you do service, and it will start to make it an amazing moneymaker for you. Now, for those of you listening, if this podcast has been a blessing for you and you want to support it financially, you can do that by becoming a Patreon subscriber. If you go to the website, patreon.com slash it's fire time, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash it's fire time, you can sign up to contribute monthly whatever amount is right for you. And I just want to give a shout out. I mentioned this earlier, but Napoleon is a company that has just 
done an amazing job of coming alongside this podcast and supporting the content for the good of the industry. And I'm going to challenge, if you're a manufacturer whose dealers are listening to this, if your team members are listening to this and you're getting value, jump on and contribute to a monthly amount. All the money that we're raising from this podcast is going to outsourcing the administrative duties so that we can continue to provide you the highest level of content possible. Now, with that said, if you guys have had any questions throughout this entire series of departments in a hearth company, you can email them to me. And in the last episode of this season, Grant and I will dive deep on answering them. If you want to do that, my email address is tim at itsfiretime.com. That's tim at itsfiretime.com. Well, I hope that you've gotten a ton out of this. It's been my joy to get to talk to you about the ins and outs of a service department. Next week is going to be awesome. So buckle up and I'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. To learn more, visit the website, itsfiretime.com. Music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. We'll see you next time. I'm all in to burn.